Muy buenos días, bienvenidos a un nuevo espacio de conversación impulsado por INOS, el Instituto de Prospectiva e Innovación en Salud. Antes de iniciar, los invitamos a seguirnos en la página www.inos.co, en nuestras redes sociales aparecemos como Instituto INOS y en nuestro canal de YouTube también pueden suscribirse. El día de hoy tendremos un espacio muy especial en cabeza de nuestro director, el doctor Carlos Felipe Escobar, quien estará acompañado de Andrew Jenner, director general de Interpath, y de Tim Wisdom, vicepresidente de Charles River Associates. Todo esto para hablar sobre el reciente estudio lanzado por estas instituciones acerca de los beneficios económicos del fortalecimiento del entorno para la innovación en Colombia, especialmente hablando en lo referente al ecosistema de salud. Sin duda será un gran espacio de diálogo y queremos invitarlos a seguir la conversación. Sin más preámbulos, yo quiero hacerle la palabra al, al director de INOS, al doctor Carlos Felipe Escobar, para que inicie la conversación. Adelante, Carlos Felipe. Andrew, team, uh, it's very nice to have you today here with us uh, in INOS. Once again, thank you very much for accepting this uh, invitation uh, to share some minutes with us, with uh, our audience. You know, uh, INOS um, is focusing in... in uh, in um, uh, sharing uh, new ideas, new insights, uh, uh, research and evidence that uh, uh, may uh, give um, uh, new elements for our decision makers and uh, all the gener general actors of uh, our healthcare uh, system in Colombia to improve, to transform. Uh, our country has huge challenges in, in health care as as every country in the world, I would say right now. Uh, 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 but uh, definitely, uh, we are convinced that um, uh, making uh, available the information and insights that uh, provides uh, new ideas, evidence-based uh, research uh, to improve what we do is a very, very, very important uh, element to improve what we do in all the levels, uh, in the national level, in policy maker, but of course, in that kind of uh, those kind of policies that we build uh, from the actors of the systems, the healthcare uh, healthcare management uh, organizations, the the healthcare providers, well, uh, general uh, uh, professionals, practitioners, and of course. Uh, the, the the patients and the uh, patient association. So in, in in Inos, we want to share this kind of insight with everybody. Uh, um, we have recently published a very very um, important and complete report regarding uh, uh, how to strengthen the healthcare ecosystem innovation ecosystem in uh, in Colombia. And uh, well, this is a great moment and a great uh, uh, possibility to share with uh, this broader audience uh, that we uh, address in Inus, uh, why uh, this is this is important and these insights are important and why we uh, as practitioners, as leaders in healthcare uh, institutions, hospitals, clinics, universities, et cetera, should care about this kind of, uh, of reports and, and students uh, try to take a look on what you have uh, presented or you have uh, documented and try to understand how it, it brings elements for all of us to make things better in, in our country. But let me start by, 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 um, by asking you, well, you have a very, very uh, uh, long time, a very strong uh, uh, CV and, uh, and professional trajectory. Why did you end up uh, uh, in this very technical field uh, of uh, research in, in healthcare, uh, innovation, and uh, well, uh, all these issues of intellectual uh, property, uh, and how what you do in your uh, in your organization are uh, changing and uh, uh, providing value for uh, <coughs> countries and policymakers to improve what we do. Andrew, let's start with you. Many thanks, Carlos, and, uh, and delighted uh, to, to be here and, and share some, some insights. So Interpat is a global trade association of, of chief IP councils from all the uh, main biopharmaceutical companies. And it's their responsibility to, to uh, obtain and use IP to help 
product launches of our medicines and our vaccines right throughout the world. For me, um, I've had a more of a, a generalist approach. I've worked in, in government and I've always found that peer to peer conversations where we put politics to one side, we we share practical insights, we share perspectives from our wealth of experience, always helps to drive positive discussions forward uh, in a far more holistic sense uh, when we get down to the detail. So that they always say the devil is in the detail. And I think that's something that as Interpat, we, we certainly subscribe to, that we want to be able to show everybody not only what we think, but why do we think the way we do, based upon our, our wealth of experience and expertise um, that we've managed to glean over the years. The other thing that we, we like to do as Interpat, we like to see ourselves as an incubator of new ideas and initiatives. But from our perspective, that those developments, that, that conversation is oh, enriched by engaging with others from different parts of the world. And so we're, we're delighted that, that we've been able to, to launch this study in, to, in Colombia and hear firsthand uh, from Colombians about how they think the innovation system in Colombia is working, things that we need to maintain, and what other areas do we need to improve. Wonderful. Wonderful. Uh, Tim. Uh, thanks, Carlos, and uh, thank you for uh, inviting us to, to talk today. So, um, Charles River Associates, we're an economics and strategy consultancy, um, but my team focuses on public policy in the life sciences area. Um, we did our first study uh, in 2003 for the, the, uh, the European Commission on uh, what was happening to innovation then in, in Europe, and the, the same challenges uh, face us today, but we have new questions. Uh, so this is a, a fascinating area. Uh, every country struggles with the, the same challenges of how to balance innovation, uh, how to make sure patients get have access uh, to that innovation. How do we ensure we have the, the jobs and economic growth that comes from having an innovative sector? So the, this is an endlessly fascinating area. And we've had the opportunity, particularly working with Interpat, to look at this question in uh, a, a set of countries in Latin America and more broadly. Uh, and we we learn from each study we do. So uh, this is an area I would encourage people to uh, be interested in because it's uh, fascinating. Absolutely, absolutely. So so let's let's start. Uh, let's start. Uh, uh, well, sharing uh, a little bit about uh, how this uh, did uh, this study came about uh, and what issues was it intended to address. General context. Thanks very much. So as part of our work in, in Interpat, we want to grow the empirical evidence base that underpins uh, our discussions. And, and, and a key part of that is how have countries developed and nurtured their innovation ecosystems in the life science sector? What kind of things drove progress um, and what kind of things um, made progress challenging? So it's about learning lessons uh, from other countries in terms of identifying best practice, um, but also avoiding costly mistakes. And so as part of this work, we've had a, a key focus on, on Latin America, and we've we started undertaking these studies in around about 2018. This study focuses on Colombia and looks at the areas that Colombia does well, um, both in terms of its policy, its legal, and the IP incentives environment that they've created, and then with an emphasis really that these things that are going well need to be maintained, uh, even when there's administration changes that can often uh, be challenging or they need to be enhanced further, but also areas that could usefully be changed to drive the innovative uh, activity that we're looking for. For us, there are four key areas to creating and nurturing uh, innovation ecosystems in, in high tech uh, sectors. And this is something that has been worked upon uh, within the International Chamber of Commerce for many years. And the first thing is having a consistent long-term strategy. Too often we find that strategies are implemented in, in a half-hearted way or a change of government changes focus, which undermines progress that's been made and sometimes even um, investor confidence and trust. So a golden thread is to have a long-term consistent strategy and we find that countries that have done that uh, do incredibly well. The second thing is 
education. It's absolutely critical, if you like. That's the building blocks of any innovation ecosystem. And we're delighted that the study shows that there's a high standard uh, of education in Colombia. But a good idea is only great. It's when it can be used, when there's some societal benefit from it. And that's where we see that Colombia could enhance its work at that all important uh, public and private sector collaboration that, that Tim will talk about in a couple of moments. The third element is open markets. I think this is a, a reoccurring theme that we want to see that both local and innovator uh, in international investors are able to, to work together, that they treat each other fairly um, and equally. And then fourthly and finally, the golden thread is a predictable, balanced and effective legal regulatory and IP system that incentivizes innovation, but facilitates collaboration so that both local and international innovators can work together to drive domestic growth, but also global competitiveness. And I think the finally, the outcome that we want to create from this study is a platform for dialogue in Colombia so that we can enhance that public-private discourse and collaboration and make meaningful progress. Because what we've seen is that the countries that get this right accelerate past those that don't. And, and we see real and major potential uh, in Colombia, both in terms of its educational infrastructure and membership of the OECD. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Wonderful and, and, and definitely great insights. You have uh, Andrew. I addressed, um, I think, uh, three things that are very, very, very uh, significant uh, in terms of of, uh, of uh, the general findings. First, the, this long-term uh, uh, view, which I think it's one of the uh, 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 biggest cha challenges in, in, in Latin America in general. Uh, uh, you, I, I think that you have studied a lot of uh, Latin American country already. And uh, you have uh, realized how uh, uh, politics in Latin America, in Latin America, change from one side to the other side, uh, or uh, from one uh, uh, perspective to a, a, another, completely different. And uh, I think that de definitely this gives uh, gives a, a, a very important uh, message. Uh, now that we are facing the uh, very very soon next year, we are facing. A, a, a new a new uh, presidential election and the uh, whole congress um, uh, uh, change so uh, definitely uh, we we hope that things uh, can move on in this uh, long term view as uh, as you have um, address um any, any any kind of of insights that uh, of insight that how countries uh, get this long term view uh, set up and and, and committed and I think, you know, Carlos, it's, it's a very good question, right? And it's about empowering people who are not connected to the politics yeah. that, that will be in those positions for a long time. You know, they, they, they've got careers that are in, whether it's a technology transfer office, whether it's an academia and, and so on. And I think there's a great recipro reciprocity that can be had between the central and local governments, because local governments, as we've seen in Mexico, the Jalisco state, really help drive innovation within the state. But I think the other thing that I think is, is important is, is that if those people, if we create the right environment and people make those connections, whatever the political wins and turmoil that there may be in countries, those connections will remain strong. And so what, what we see is, is, is that it's, it's all about people. It's governments create the right framework, but if we empower the right people in universities so that they can drive public-private collaboration, that we're not putting hurdles in their way, we're not having too much bureaucracy making it difficult, those are the kind of golden threads that will help generate this long-term strategy. So that even if there's a, a political shift, if you like, um, or there's, there's movement that, that not altogether supports IP, the people will take it through those, those stormy seas to make sure that the progress that's been made is is not lost. Yeah, absolutely. You 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 made me uh, remember um, uh, one statement we 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 heard some years ago. Um, I don't remember. I, I think it was from Brazil. Someone from Brazil uh, saying that uh, well, there were two fields. 
uh, that are so important uh, to societies, to countries, uh, uh, that you we shall not uh, never leave uh, long-term policy policies in hands of governments, and those are health and education. Yeah, if you want to get really good results, you need to get rid of government in long-term planning uh, and long-term view. And, uh, and try to put them in in in, in hands of uh, let's say multi-sectoral uh, um, and independent uh, uh, view. I think uh, I don't know if some country has 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 moved that uh, that way, but I, I I need to confess that I really agree with these these kind of uh, yeah. Of, I, I of completely views. I completely agree. It's it's challenging. We know politicians like to to get involved as soon as they come into power, but. Again, I think the countries that, that get this right will keep the talent within their countries. We know that now people are very mobile and we don't want to lose people from our countries so that they're innovating for problems elsewhere. We want to keep them in our countries, innovating for problems within our countries, uh, and then hopefully that will have utility outside. So I, I think it's, it's trying to find that balance you know, so that we don't have these shifts and changes. But Carlos, I completely agree with you. If that would be, if you like, a, a utopian vision, if we could try to yeah. be politicized. <laughs> absolutely. absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Maybe, maybe Carl, just can I add one point? Because I, I think I agree with everything you both said. But the, one of the things I suppose we've found also is it, it, innovation really does deliver shared benefits that you that go across society. They, they obviously benefit patients. They, they benefit uh, the economic sectors uh, working in it. Uh, they, they benefit kind of the academic sectors working for it. So this this is a real win-win where we create surplus economic benefits we can share. And so often uh, policies look like we're favoring the innovators versus the generics, or we're favoring the public sector versus the public uh, private sector. But this is an area where if you can actually get the synergies and the sectors to work together, this brings benefits to both. And we can set out those the metrics of how that works in terms of employment, taxes, economic growth, etc. So I think this concept of shared benefits, this isn't favoring one uh, group in society versus another. This is creating value that we can actually share across society. Absolutely. 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 And uh I think that you you you, you have point. Uh, um, I think that I would like to move on. Uh, I think a little bit later after you uh, you comment us about the uh, main findings and the and the, and, and how you uh, uh, develop the this the study. But uh, I would like to uh, have some insights from you uh, on this uh, duality of healthcare, both as a system that should should uh, care and take care for for a. Uh, 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 a right of citizens, the right of health, uh, of life, etc., but also a, uh, an industry and a, and a market in which uh, you uh, uh, can develop uh, economic uh, growth, employment uh, opportunities uh, for people. So, so there's a, a dual uh, a nature of, of healthcare uh, uh, systems that uh, I think that it's uh, it's very important. Uh, uh, that we we hear your insights on how to uh, improve this understanding of healthcare uh, uh, and uh, and get aware of this. Let's say only focus on on the that we have in, in general in Latin America as healthcare only as a system uh, intended to uh, provide a service uh, that is. Uh, 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 a right for for uh, 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 a human right for 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 our our citizens. So so, but we, we move later on that. And uh, now and uh, now, uh, uh, team, I would really appreciate if you can tell us a little bit how was the student uh, the study developed, and uh, well, main findings. You have started to to mention some of them, but great to know a little bit more of them. Great. Well, well, I'll, 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 I've got a couple of slides I, I, I might use, so I'll just step right. through them. Uh, but Andrew, jump, jump in and add any other points that, uh, you would like to uh, as well. So, so I think uh, Andrew and, and Carlos has already set out kind of what, what, why we were doing this study. I, I suppose it's important to mention Afidro, and Afidro have really, really helped us steer this project. Uh, and um, 
direct this in the right direction, hopefully that's very useful for the Colombian debate in Colombian settings. So, uh, this is building on uh, previous uh, reports. We've, we've done a literature review. You'll find lots of sources. I'm, I'm not trying to entice people to read the full report. You'll find that we've uh, got lots of good sources where we're trying to add on to this long debate uh, that's happened in Colombia. So we're not claiming this is the first study on innovation, but we hopefully this takes the studies along and builds on the very good government reports, think tank reports, uh, etc. Et, et well, I wanted just to quickly pause on, on, uh, on this slide because one of the the key uh, elements into this report was the, the interviews. Uh, and we, we obviously did a lot of interviews with uh, the innovative sector, so the Colombian teams of international pharmaceutical companies talking to a Fidro. Um, but as important, even more important, uh, are the interviews we did with other stakeholders. So uh, government departments, national planning department, uh, the Ministry of Health, uh, INVIMA, uh, the Patent Office, uh, and then experts um, and influencers, including Carlos, uh, who very kindly did an interview uh, for this project. So we, we as CRA, we, we spend our lives thinking about innovation policy, but we don't, we're not experts on Colombia. So these interviews were um, a huge part of this project. I, I must say, we've done this project in a, a range of different Latin American countries. I think the interviews were the best in Colombia, uh, and I hopefully that uh, means that this will be uh, a good debate to carry on talking for each with each other because as Andrew says this needs to be long running but it also needs to be multi-stakeholder and us talking to each other and this is it was very promising uh, how open people were to to talk to us uh, the final bit of kind of um, methodology was a very simple framework uh, and you'll see this is very simple what do you need to get uh, innovation to occur, you need the resources, the uh, funding, expertise, the healthcare system, and we'll come back to that later on. You need good policies, innovation policies, IP policies, uh, trade and growth policies. And if you get that right, that will lead to innovative activities, um, such as the, the metrics below, basic research product development, and it will lead to these industrial activities of employment uh, and trade. So a simple framework uh, was applied. Um, what we, we then did was to apply that to Colombia, do a comparative assessment of Colombia, comparing these metrics uh, for Colombia versus other Latin American countries, and then say, well, given those issues, how have other countries adapted their policy environment and what benefits have they done? And that's exactly as you were suggesting, Carlos, look for other case study uh, countries uh, and then simulate the impact uh, that has on uh, on Colombia. I don't know, Andrew, if you wanted to add anything to that before I kind of go into the findings. No, that's all good, Tim. I think that's I think you covered that well. Okay, C Carlos, shall I keep going or? Um... Yeah, keep going, please. Okay. So, so what did what did we find? Um, well, I, I'll go through this at a high level. I know we haven't got that long today, uh, but we we did these comparisons, and you'll find the. Uh, the metrics we compared in the report. So each of these has a set of statistics. So in universities, we're looking at the percentage of the top 500 uh, institutions. In education, we're looking at the percentage of STEM uh, students, uh, etc. What we find is Colombia is very strong in terms of universities, both in Latin America, and there's also a good comparison to the uh, OECD. In terms of the STEM students coming through, that's also uh, impressive. So a strong educational infrastructure. In terms of researchers, we saw this growing very nicely uh, up until about four or five years ago, but has flattened off. And I suppose that's where the uh, it, it ends up having this half Harvey Ball assessment. The one where I think we think it's uh, Columbia has the most work to do is on collaborations, both between uh, with international researchers, uh, within public and private institutions, and in small and large companies. In each of those, we can find metrics that suggest Columbia is some way behind some of its Latin uh, American peers. And you can we'll relate that to some of the policies uh, later on. In terms of the healthcare infrastructure, um, certainly the spending on health in terms of the infrastructure of the healthcare system, which is really important for the scientific innovation. Um, Colombia is in the middle of the other Latin American countries. So, so, so some, some work to be uh, done. And, and then maybe I'll just go through a couple more slides. What we then did is through our interview say, well, where have we got work to do in the policy environment? I won't go through all of these, but just two really interesting results. So the importance of the healthcare system 
for innovation. This is the highest list scored across uh, the Latin American countries uh, we, we looked at. And then on the right hand side, many of these things, regulatory data protection, the risk of compulsory licensing, that is very common uh, across Latin American countries. But education about IP rights, us getting on the same page as to what these IP rights are trying to do, that was scored a lot uh, higher in Colombia than others. And I suppose that reflects that this research was being done when we were really talking about this bill, Bill 372, the discussion of compulsory license in the manufacturing. And this was really ever present in people's minds as we were doing these interviews, that there was a, a big difference, maybe a false difference in some ways, because I think we all want to promote innovation, but then some of these things could, could hinder and ha harm the dialogue. I'll just do one more slide uh, and then I'll pause. So what do we actually see in Colombia? So we've got the top two boxes, which I've done. What do we see at the bottom two boxes? Well, here the picture is much more mixed. R&D investment, 0.3%, heavily dominated by private uh, investment. So very unbalanced compared to uh, other countries. In, in terms of early research, a difficult thing to measure, but we do publications. The number of publications is very low, but then being cited is very high. So the quality is good, but we're just not doing enough uh, collaborations across international research, research centers. Clinical trials, there clearly are an activity going on in Colombia, but it's not about the distribution we'd like to see. And patents, although it is growing, and we've seen some good policy reforms there, it's got growing from a small base. Um, in terms of employment, better, quite a good, uh, but in terms of the rewards, the royalties to innovation, it, 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 uh, Colombia scores quite uh, badly compared to other Latin American countries. So we end up with this very mixed scorecard. We have a which kind of reflects the inputs, very strong uh, academic infrastructure, but with some areas on the policy side and in terms of collaborations we really need to work on. So I'll, I'll pause there. Great, great, wonderful. So, so um, let me let, let, let me start by the, by this question. Um, you you have found a very strong, um, uh, let's say, uh, education ba background. Uh, and uh, we are, let's say, um, um, we have a, a stronger and a, and a tertiary um, higher education uh, system. Uh, and um, while well, the number of, of, um, of research uh, groups and uh, PhDs uh, that we are, we are um, um, educating in, in, uh, in universities is growing. However, um, uh, we have around 96 if uh, 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 that's uh, the, the the recent number of these PhDs um, uh, in universities uh, how to address this issue of uh, the disconnection that we ha we have uh, in our country between um, uh, PhDs and and and, uh, and and researchers from the industry field maybe maybe I can stop. Uh, I think we've got to try to break the disconnect between uh, companies and the academic sector. This, this needs to be seen uh, as, as a, uh, a mutually important area. Uh, lots of the PhD jobs, uh, and very much we want people to stay in Colombia, but will some of them will obviously go on and stay in academia, but many of them will go on, hopefully, and work in the, uh, the life sciences, the research industry. Uh, and so this division between the academia and the, the companies is one we want to, to break down. And, and that means um, working collaboratively, fellowships, for, for example, internships. Um, and it also means the culture in, in universities of seeing a PhD as training to work in the life sciences industry. And it also means uh, the, the institutions working together in, in terms of things like clinical trial programs, in terms of research grants. So, so I think that side is, it, Columbia is not unique here. There, there is, it, it's making sure that academia has a, has a very distinct role to uh, obviously the industrial sector, but they need to work together because there's a synergy uh, between uh, them working together. So it's, it's a changing culture and it's changing the mindset as to how students are, what, what are you going into a PhD program to do? You're obviously going in there to add to uh, the understanding of the issue. But it's also something that has a real application 
to the development of medicines that are so beneficial to society and patients. So it's breaking down that culture is where I would start. Yeah, and just to just to add to that, I remember when I was um, in government, we we had we had a lot of work that we were doing in Scotland to do education around the benefits of, of intellectual property. And uh, the interesting thing was is, is that they were saying we, we fully understand that the benefits and look what we've been doing as universities. And they had worked very hard on getting um, people who understood how to secure and use IP rights and, and were understanding the value that could be created to the university, to future generations of students. But they've also, what they've done, which we found fascinating is, is this linkage to, to industry and this idea of the spin-off from the university, whereby they go and work for a company, but, and they, they set up their own small company. Um, they, they, it's, it's independent in terms of its governance, but they can use the university equipment. And of course, this is a mutually beneficial thing because you want to have the university that's, uh, that's linked to the private sector where, as Tim mentioned, the majority of students will hopefully go and work one day so that they can make innovation that will get to, to patients uh, ultimately. Uh, but also that the companies then can can secure the next generation of scientists and engineers, whoever it might be, that will be the ones who will be the engine uh, for the innovation machinery. So there is these very powerful, mutually beneficial synergies that can be created as long as there is that breakdown of cultural barriers and that both can see that benefit, understand the benefit and build the trust. And I think there are a number of countries, some small, some large, that have done this very well. And there's, if you like, there's multiple roadmaps that could be done uh, and, and adopted. Wonderful. I, I think that's, um, th those are great insights. And, uh, and I think that uh, it comes to, to uh, really a, a, a very a embedded issue in, the, in our culture here, I would say here in, in, in Latin America in general. Uh, which is um, uh, PhDs are highly uh, uh, involved in universities, in academic uh, research, uh, mainly focused on, on, on the, let's say, improving uh, publication uh, uh, KPIs of universities that are rewarded with the high quality accreditation of the universities and recognition of, of the university as a as, uh, uh, as, uh, in, in the research field, uh, but with with uh, with um, loose ties with the uh, with industry, both from the relation university uh, industry or because the the these these uh, doctoral and, and PhD uh, researchers move to work with the with the, uh, with industry. So it's it's something very very interesting because uh, interesting because because we see uh, our academic uh, people saying we don't have opportunities. Uh, uh, to 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 get uh, involved in the uh, high paid roles in research, in industry, etc. Uh, while at the same time, uh, let's say we don't understand the question: Why is that uh, industry is not is is not getting involved uh, with the, uh, and, and and not recruiting more and more researchers to do uh, more research uh, with uh, inside the the, the, the companies or in collaboration with the universities and then then the the, the i think that the, the question that is never uh, wanted to be asked is uh, what, uh, how we are guaranteeing uh, the return on the investment of uh, this uh, industry of the industry uh, 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 getting involved with with the uh, uh, science uh, and uh, and research uh, in in this in this field because because uh, 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 there's a general uh, trend here that uh, 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 academia is uh, is not so friendly with IP rights and and uh, and uh, and and result of of, uh, of of investment. So so it's a little bit contradictory in my point of view uh, what we do. But uh, they, I think that it's very important the message that you you, you have uh, addressed uh, research uh, uh, employments. This this employments involved in research uh, fields in the healthcare. Uh, both in 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 uh, scientific uh, and clinical uh, research that we can do are 
uh, highly paid uh, uh, positions uh, very uh, that are a very good opportunity for many for uh, for sure of the people that are watching uh, uh, this uh, this uh, this conversation between between us and uh, definitely we can uh, promote the the research in in healthcare everywhere in the world is very well recognized and and, and i think it should be recognized as a possibility to improve uh, uh the, the 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 compensation of many people involved in the, in in healthcare uh, uh, areas in 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 countries like like ours so let's let's wait that the, this uh, this this issue uh, uh improve improves in the in the long term uh, tell us a little bit about your recommendations regarding uh, the strengthening of the IP uh, system uh, uh, in, in, in the country, which are the main points that you would uh, recommend. Great. Well, th thanks, Carlos. Uh, and I'll, I'll just show, um, just feeding on your, your last point, uh, lots of other countries have dealt with some of these, these issues. Uh, and the, the point of this study is to kind of show the benefits. So you'll find in our study uh, a set of case studies. Some of them seem a long way away from Colombia, but that, that's almost the point. It, it's these countries have dealt with these issues sometimes long enough ago that we can see the benefits of them. Uh, and you'll see here it's about the pattern system, RDP, technological capabilities, uh, the health integration with the healthcare system. So there's lots. Hopefully this uh, study can point uh, people who are interested to where there are some case studies of countries that have dealt with the same challenges, introduced policy, and actually seen it through. So they've actually seen seen the benefits. Uh, so what we do in the study is say, well, what if what if you applied those uh, to Colombia? So you'll find some quantitative uh, results, which are trying to show that shared benefit uh, that I described uh, earlier on. But the main, I suppose, point is well, what. What, is, what does this say for the priorities in policy? I think, Carlos, that's, that's your question. Um, well, some of these we've, we've already touched on. Um, so one, the countries that have done this well have not only implemented it, they've stuck with it and kept some, uh, although we've seen changes in government, we've seen a continuity of purpose around uh, innovation. And, and this isn't seeing a new innovation plan every two or three years. This is seeing a step of innovation plans where we carry on uh, doing this. So a long-term plan is, is clearly uh, one of the benefits. Innovation's been on the agenda in Colombia for a long time. Uh, we, we might actually benefit from slightly less plans, but slightly more continuity, uh, if, if that's uh, an okay thing to say. Secondly, um, we need to invest in the institutions. There, there clearly are some issues in uh, the investment, the, the staffing levels, the permanency of staff in some of the institutions. So this is both a plan and an investment in the uh, the bodies that you uh, em employ to follow through uh, some of these plans. Then you've got the culture uh, for collaboration. And, and this, uh, we've already touched on kind of the, the, the cultural part of breaking down the links, uh, breaking down the barriers between uh, academia and companies. But you've also got the other side of that, as Carlos, you were hinting at, uh, tech transfer offices, IP at universities, making sure this is seen as a a shared benefit of equal partners. And I know the National Department of Planning is looking at some of those issues. We completely agree, and they're the issues uh, to, to be focusing on. Just just two more. Um, one of the areas which is seen to be the most disjointed, and this is not unique to Colombia, is the, the role of the healthcare system in, in innovation. It's seen as um, almost uh, harmful to be doing innovation policy within the healthcare system. And in our experience, that's that's not right. We're, we're trying to develop uh, new treatments for patients, uh, having integration with the healthcare system, clinical trials with under, with all the protections and regulations required, being seen as a positive attribute within the healthcare system, uh, and reducing some of the regulatory barriers to doing that uh, it would be really important. And that's where I think that finding of uh, access to the healthcare system being seen as an innovation policy is really important. Uh, for Colombia. And then the last one is IP. And this does seem, it gets a bit technical and arcane, but it's really important. And we've actually seen uh, countries that have implemented this in a pro-innovation way, we've seen the benefits. So this is both of our education programs and us all being uh, on the same page. It's some soft issues like communication between Invima uh, and the industry, Invima and the patent office, the different departments of government 
uh, talking to each other uh, and all what, at least understanding the justification for de decisions is, is obviously an important element here. And then elements like uh, regulatory data protection. Obviously, we, we have it in Colombia. There's an ambiguity of how it's uh, applied. And, and when you think of countries that have applied this well, this is a positive element, and it's not one that diminishes one industry versus another. It actually benefits all of the industrial uh, sectors, uh, the innovative sector and the generic sector. And this is one where I think a lack, a lack of ambiguity would be a really uh, a step forward for Colombia. So there, there are four policy recommendations. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. And um, any additional insight, uh, Andrew? Well, it's, it's interesting. We were uh, just previous to this, I was on a call in, in China and there's been a new Chinese uh, policy document that's recently just been published. And one thing that they say is that they profoundly understand that strengthening IP is one of the most critical things to boost China's global economic competitiveness. And I think, you know, obviously China is, 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 a, is, a, is, a, is an interesting market in its own right, but there is this realization that if you want to create a value-based innovative framework, it has to be underpinned by robust intellectual property protection. And to Tim's point, and I think, you know, this is the tension that you mentioned between the innovation and access. You want to have the innovation, you want to create the innovation, um, and having the right IP framework will mean that products, the newest products are launched within your market. And that's what you want them to be. You want them to be made available to patients. And then when you're coming to value those, it shouldn't be seen as a cost to the health system, but more of a value to society. Because if someone's cured in six weeks as opposed to six months, there's huge societal benefit because that person can go back out to their jobs, look after their family. But there's also massive economic benefits, uh, both in terms of um, the, uh, the welfare of the individual and, and, and the contribution to, to the economy. So... What we see is, is that there has to be that holistic view of, of innovation within government. Finance ministries getting involved is often a very useful thing because they take these societal economic um, attributes around value into account in terms of how is it that you value um, innovation. So it goes from a purely seen as a, as a cost to an investment in, in the future. And that's something where we see that countries do well is when there is that long-term view so that innovation is not undermined just for short-term objectives that are short-lived. Because if you, if you do that, it creates this, this uncertainty in the marketplace. For example, arbitrary issuing of compulsory licenses is one of the examples that makes uh, innovation um, challenging in terms of its investment. But countries that say, yeah, we want to get access, let's have a conversation with the companies about how we achieve that access, that's far more... Um, sustainable in the long term. And we found that countries that do that get the innovation they need, but also get the access that they're looking for. Wonderful. Wonderful. So great insights uh, uh, from this study. I think that you have shared with us uh, in a very clear way uh, how important is, it is to take a look on, on the, the whole uh, healthcare innovation ecosystem if we want to uh, move on uh, solving the big challenges that uh, uh, we have uh, in Latin America and uh, in particular in our country regarding uh, our healthcare um, ecosystem in the next uh, uh, years. Um, definitely, um, I think that uh, that we we can uh, we can uh, we can say that um, uh, recognizing this um, uh, dual nature of he healthcare, uh, both as a system. Uh, which in which uh, governments and the state should guarantee the people the access to high quality equitable healthcare uh, uh, services to 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 fulfill uh, the rights every citizen has should be let's say balanced with this opportunity to uh, improve uh, what we do uh, what we do and our performance and our participation in a, a, a global interdependent uh, healthcare innovation uh, ecosystem in which we can also let's say uh, 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 provide opportunities to new industries new jobs uh, new forms of of cooperation between our 
universities, local industry, and international and global industry in the, the different fields. I have I, I have shared with my students, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm I'm a medical doctor. Uh, I, with my students, some some very simple th uh, way way to introduce them in 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 this issue of IP, which is uh, let's say so 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 far away from our understanding in in as healthcare professional and any and it is uh uh several studies have, have shown that uh, around 60 percent of the tools that we use as medical doctors diagnostic tools therapeutic uh, tools uh, uh, either it is in pharma or a surgical procedures uh, rehabilitation uh, tools that we use come from ip are supported because we have established worldwide an ip system so if you don't like uh, intellectual property, it's better not to study uh, medicine because you you will not have tools to treat your patients. That's that's the reality. Uh, uh, however, I think that the the way and the mind frame we 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 create, and it was very fun to, uh, to share this with with uh, Sir Robin Jacobs. The, uh, uh, you you know him in the in the UK. Yeah. We shared this insight, and he said it's the same thing here in in, in the UK. We 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 educate healthcare professionals thinking that uh, well everything is in place and you just need to use it uh, to provide it to your patient and uh, uh, there is not no 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 word regarding uh, uh, no insights regarding uh, uh, where all these tools we use daily come from and uh, and there is definitely a, a, a change when you you start uh, understanding this uh, in this in this point of in this uh, uh, perspective which I think is the basis of of, uh, of so many many myths and questionings we have uh, uh, of uh, about our IP uh, systems in general in health. So thank you very much for for sharing all these all these insights uh, with us, um, Andrew and team. Uh, I think the, the, this this is a great uh, study, uh, full of uh, insights that uh, uh, of course you can consult. Uh, in uh, uh, in Inos, it's available, and also in 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 the Interpad uh, web page, you will find a, a attach uh, after this presentation uh, the links uh, to to be able to uh, consult the full uh, report that uh, uh, has been uh, presented uh, here. Once again, Andrew and Tim, thank you very much for all your insights. Many thanks, Carlos. Very much appreciated, and look forward to continuing the discussion. Wonderful. Nice Thank you.